All right. Uh, we are going to start. Uh, the, the good morning, everyone. Welcome to our open house at EVMS. My name is Dr. Morshadi, and be presenting an overview of reproductive clinical science programs. With me to answer any questions you might have are Dr. Yu, Associate Prog Program Director. Uh, Dr. Mayer, uh, who is uh, present, but we don't see his picture, uh, and <laughs> Professor Helena Russell. That's me. Uh, before I start with the main presentation, I would like to make some housekeeping announcements. Uh, we have a turn off the microphones. Uh, please use the chat rooms to pose your questions. Alternatively, you can raise your hand and we can turn on the microphone so that they can pose your questions also via microphone. Uh, this information session ends at 11.45 a.m. sharp. If you need to contact us later, please contact us via email. And uh, the RCS courses, EVMS EDU is a proper email for you to send us your questions. Uh, for the, this first part of presentation is for our master's and certificate programs. And the latter part, we discussed our PhD program. So if any of you uh, are interested in a PhD program, remember that we are going to discuss it in the latter half of the program. I encourage you to take the survey following this information session. You will receive an email from CVENT with link to the survey. And we are going to start uh, now with uh, information about uh, our uh, so-called uh, distance program and the masters. Uh, but before doing that, uh, I want to let you know that we have uh, four different programs in at uh, reproductive clinical science. Uh, one is masters in reproductive clinical science. The other one is PhD in reproductive science. And also we have certificates in clinical andrology and clinical embryology that we discuss about these certificates shortly. Related to masters in reproductive clinical science, uh, we discuss our program goals and curriculum and residential events career potential and admission requirements. Now, the goal and objective of master's program is teaches you the relevance and application of advances in biochemistry, cell biology, and genetics as they apply to various assisted reproductive techniques. You will learn the reproductive endocrinologies, embryologies, and andrologies perspectives for diagnosis and treatment of infertility, and apply the best practice in clinical embryology and andrology laboratory and reproductive medicine research, and prepare and adapt for the new technologies as well as new regulatory guidelines. And the uh, masters certainly strengthens your skills in clinical readings and interpreting the research literature, helps you develop independent synthesis analysis and the study design skills through writing a thesis anticipate future laboratory and personnel requirements, and understand biomedical, ethical, as well as legal principles and patient privacy issues as they relate to clinical IVF 
and medical research. And you master basic hands-on clinic, hands-on skills in embryology as well as andrology. Now, the master's program established in 2003 in, in so-called partnership with the Jones Institute for Reproductive Medicine. As you know, Jones Institute is a pioneer institute in reproductive medicine and the first IVF baby in the U.S. was born here in this institute. And uh, so it's very reputable, internationally known institute. We cooperate with the faculty at the Jones and that's one of the advantages that our program has. It's a two-year master's program and consists of six semesters. What it means that summer semesters also you will be uh, taking courses. It's an online didactic courses and required two residential uh, programs, meaning you have to be here to learn uh, so-called various hands-on techniques and also become familiar with the internship that we have with some other laboratories. The curriculum for the masters is a cohort type of scheduling, what it means that all of you take the same courses at the same time, and it would be two to three classes at a time, meaning per semester or per week, how you want to look at it, you will have two or three classes. And allocation of a time for a study basically is around 15 to 20 hours a week. Of course, it varies depending on your background. And it could be a little bit more or less. Nevertheless, you have to allocate approximately 20 hours of your uh, so-called time for studying. What it means is that if you have a full-time job, you're going to have a half-time job also on the top of it and we use a so-called learning management system uh, blackboard uh, to communicate with you or you communicate with us in regard to the classes. Uh, curricula are shown uh, uh, or curriculum is showed in the, the two slides this one and the following slides it looks a little bit busy I try to explain what this consists of uh, the curriculum consists of three main categories of courses. One basic graduate level courses, such as biochemistry and molecular biology, statistics and genetics. Number two, courses related to human reproduction, such as gametes and embryos and cryopreservation of reproductive cells and tissues. You will have courses in female reproduction, and infertility. Uh, there are courses also related to male reproduction and infertility. We have courses in assisted reproductive techniques such as IVF and you will have journal club discussing current topics in reproduction. And number three, you have also graduate level courses related to how co to conduct research and write a thesis. You will be required to conduct a research for your master's degree and write a thesis. The topics can be original ideas or methods or can be review projects, meaning reviewing relevant topics in uh, reproduction. You will be assisted with the topics. So with that, I will pass to the the next two slides because I just explained what is content of these two slides. We go to the residential week because the program overall is is a the online course, uh, but we have two weeks of residential uh, for you that you need to attend, and these are mandatory on-campus events. For the first year, it would be in third week of July, 
that is Sunday to Friday. For your information, it would be uh, July 11 to 16 of 2021. And the purpose of these on-campus events or so-called residential week is to meet the faculty and your classmates. And you have a hands-on training. You will be given lectures and we will certify you in regard to your uh, capabilities to handle certain laboratory techniques. For the second year, it would be third week of June. That is again Sunday to Saturday in this case, and would be uh, for the uh, people who are gonna apply would be June of 2022. Here it says 21, it should be 22. Again, you will have hands-on training and lectures and again, certification of your capabilities to handle certain laboratory techniques. And at the same time, you are gonna present your uh, capstone and thesis presentation that you have already worked on for in the previous year. Now, question always comes, what does a master's do for me or for you in that matter? Uh, then we are gonna discuss about career potential. Again, uh, the training would be in the form of you are gonna be trained in the area of embryology and andrology. For those who do not know, andrology is an investigation of male infertility in the laboratory that deals with such investigations. Uh, you will have internship in embryology, andrology, and research uh, that we can arrange it for you if it's needed. Of course, you have to recognize that we have limitations in regard to internship because of COVID. At this time, we do our best to help you finding a place for internship. The same also applies to the uh, week of residential course uh, that you need to be here. Uh, again, COVID is a limiting factor or has been so far for us, but nevertheless, we do our best to manage uh, or arrange so that you can come here and have your on-campus uh, so-called residential week. And again, hands-on skills and training and certifications are all advantages or so-called the capabilities that you gain when you take this particular uh, specialty or master's program. Now, admission deadline and requirements. The deadline uh, for admission or is November 1st or applying so-called November 1st and January 2nd. Of course, the first deadline has already passed but nevertheless, you can have time until January 2nd to apply for it, uh, and it won't be any much different from those who have applied for the first, for, or de first deadline, so-called. Uh, we have started to review some applications, so the sooner you uh, apply, uh, the sooner you will know the results of your so-called application uh, and admission. Uh, it would be online application that you have to get to GradCast and make sure uh, when you get to GradCast to complete the form, choose the summer of 2021, not fall of 21, because your classes start with the summer of 2021. You will need to provide us beside the application that you complete a personal essay uh, telling us uh, why you are choosing this particular major or specialty. And uh, you need to provide us your CV resume or job history. You need also to provide us with the two letters of recommendation and a skills report or observation. What it means that you need to have uh, some sort of uh, information about what is really embryology and in vitro fertilization is, what are the advantages and disadvantages so that you are uh, comfortable with your choice of uh, attending this particular master's program. Uh, 
and the requirements for the master's program is that you have to have a bachelor's degree or higher in biology, chemistry, or related fields with two semesters of biology and chemistry with laboratories associated with these two subjects. You have to have a GPA of 2.75 or better, and all previous institution official documents need to be uh, so-called uh, provided to us. And again, you need to contact your individuals who are going to provide you with the letters of recommendation so that uh, they can uh, write those letters as soon as possible so that we can go ahead with uh, so-called interviewing you for the next phase of uh, admission. And uh, I am a little bit uh, here. Uh, the, the screen is not uh, very okay. I hear it better. I see it. Uh, individuals who are international students, they have to have a TOEFL, and their transcript should be translated by official translator. And the transcript should be evaluated by a third party for accuracy of translation. And there are companies who are doing that, and, uh, as noted in this slide. And we can provide you with that information if it's needed. Uh, transcript should be in English and institutions use the credit system they should use or they be translated in a fashion that we can understand what courses you have taken and how they look like similar to or how they compare to the U.S. method. Uh, that's all uh, we have in regard to the Masters in Reproductive Clinical Science. If you have any questions, please let us know at the end after I finish with this part of the presentation. Uh, we go for Reproductive Clinical Science certificates. We have two certificates available for individuals who are interested in a certificate in clinical andrology and clinical embryology. For clinical andrology, a certificate is geared towards those who desire to improve their basic knowledge in the field of andrology, that is a male infertility evaluations. They need to have a GPA of 2.75 or better. And the certificate is a one year, three semester program and it starts with the fall semesters, not the summer. So it would be fall, spring, and the summer. One week of andrology and IVF summer residential training, it would be a part of this certificate, similar to the master's program. And credit earned may be used towards a master's in reproductive clinical science. Admissions. Uh, requirements and curriculum are noted in our websites. You can approach it or log into the website to obtain more information. The courses that you are going to take for clinical andrology certificates are uh, male reproductive function and dysfunction, current topics in IVF in a form of journal crop, you have cryopreservation of reproductive tissue and cells, and you will have introduction to laboratory techniques, uh, particularly in vitro fertilization techniques. For certificate in clinical embryology, uh, again, it's geared to those who desire to improve their basic knowledge in the field of clinical embryology is a one year, four semester, is actually it's a three semesters course. Uh, and the start with the fall semester, similar to the uh, certificate in andrology. And 
also similarly have one week of in biology and neurology summer residential course and more information can be obtained through our uh, website. The courses for clinical embryology is a female. Uh, they, uh, they are female reproductive ecology and infertility, gametes and embryos, and ethics, society, and arts. And similar to andrology, you will have introduction to IVF and laboratory techniques that is performed or is done or arranged during the summer hands-on or on-campus training. Now, I stop here before I go for a PhD program, and I would like to the, entertain your, your questions that you may have. If you would like, um, you can go ahead and um, if you have a microphone, you could turn it on right now. Um, Ami, Sanu, there you go. <laughs> Hi, yeah, my name is Ami. Um, I have one question about the embryology certificate program. Is a GPA requirement the same for the certificate andrology program? Because I didn't yes. see that on the slide. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's the yeah. same as the master's. Okay, thank you. Yes. Go ahead, John. John. You can use your microphone yeah. if you'd like. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me okay now? Yep. Yep. Okay, great. Um, so I just posted a URL uh, on the chat. Um, right now, I'm actually working on a master's in neuroimmunology, and I'm interested in the long term of doing work. Uh, with stem cells and embryos. So um, curious to know if either the master's or doctorate level uh, address any of these um, technologies for the future. We're pretty focused on clinical embryology, although we talk about and learn about gametes and embryos and stem cells and you know, basically the fundamentals of what you of what you've just posted. I'm looking at the website now, um, but our focus is um, to give. Um, I'll tell you what, how our program started was by um, trying to support individuals who were engaged in uh, practice of clinical IVF in vitro fertilization in the laboratory. We're trying to support those individuals. Um, giving them the background that they need in order to understand why they're doing what they're doing. So the science behind the technologies that they're using. Does that make sense? Yes, completely. So, you know, I guess what I'm thinking is um, by completing the master's, at least I'll have the skills and the knowledge oh, yes. uh, uh, to apply yeah. to the laboratory. Because I know one of the things that, in terms of clinical practice is how to determine, you know, the rhythms of a healthy embryo and, and, and different things. Do you also go into genetic testing at all? Oh, yes, quite a bit. We actually boosted that up a little bit in the past few years because of the important role that it plays in clinical IVF. Also, I w would like to tell you the PhD program is more geared toward um, academic and basic research. It's about, um, you know, really create, if you, re if you read our website, and, and of course Dr. Morchetti is going to introduce this later, but it's about becoming an independent researcher, really. Yeah. Right. Okay, so, so on, yeah, yes. Yeah. No, please, after you, sir. Yeah, I know. You may want to stay for a PhD program because having a master's, uh, you may want to check to see what are the prerequisites for PhD. You may not have all of the courses that are required, but since you have already uh, or uh, finishing a master's program, 
taking those prerequisite courses may not be a bad idea so that you can start with the PhD. For your particular area, perhaps, uh, again, I'm not familiar with the courses you have already taken. That's something we have to look at. Uh, but it could be PhD also an option for you. Okay, great. So, you know, just a final question, and then I'll let you folks continue. Um, is there anyone that can kind of, uh, you know, evaluate where I am right now, you know, in the next few weeks uh, to see if it would be appropriate to apply for PhD? I mean, I could. I could help you. Yeah. Yeah. All okay. you need to do is just send us your unofficial transcripts from your master's and then schedule a meeting. And we can go over what, you know, what our thoughts are about your prospects. Okay. Fantastic. I appreciate your time. Dr. Mayer, any idea about my suggestion for him? Uh, uh, I think you hit, it, hit the nail right on the head. Uh, the question is, is um, uh, is what he's getting in the master's now going to um, give him the information? If he wants the background in uh, how to handle embryos, um, we can certainly give him that. Um, yeah. We're not as strong in uh, in uh, stem cell work, but uh, it's not it's not our main focus. There's we touch on it, but. Um, uh, if he's interested in uh, knowing more about embryos, uh, he certainly come to the right place. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Dr. Yu, anything? No? no okay. Dr. Mashadi, I think uh, Kavendi posted a question about the application numbers each year. Okay. What was the question? Can you tell me? For the yeah. master's program? Right. Is that the one? Yeah, because in our website it says 25 students are accepted every year, but uh, uh, what the question is how many application applications are submitted each year? Helena, you want to answer this question? Yeah. 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 What? It varies, uh, but Helena can uh, pitch in. Uh, generally, the COVID uh, the COVID year is is difficult for us to make any judgment. Uh, or answer correctly, so-called, uh, uh, to the question. And, uh, but nevertheless, in the past, we have had uh, as high as 30, 35, uh, correct me. Oh, no, uh, that's much too low. We've two to three times as many applications. In the past, we've had, it depends on the year, like Dr. Morshetti said, but um, 45, 50, 70, it just depends on the year. Right now, we're um, we're experiencing, as he said, it's, it's challenging because of COVID. It's very difficult for people to, I think, make a commitment to. Uh, it's just so much uncertainty. Yeah. And many of these applicants currently are working in the area of infertility and IVF, and certainly the employers are having difficulty managing the COVID issues and the time that some of these applicants require to study. So we cannot really uh, elaborate on the numbers based on the, the limitations that we have had with the COVID. So the last two years or year and a half uh, has been difficult and particularly now, uh, if you're asking us, uh, even though it's early in admission process, uh, we have had how many, the Professor Russell, we have had so far? Nine, uh, at least. <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 Um, so I mean, we have right, 30, right 30 now, months in progress and uh, nine completed applications submitted. We have 38 applications total, nine completed, so. Just so you know, la um, this past year we had a drop, I think, because of COVID. But the year before, we had a full cohort of students who started with 25. And the year before right. that, we started with 26. So right. this last year was challenging. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 
John, you have a question. So there's a follow-up question about our website to get more information about the certificate programs. Yeah, we are just uh, had these certificates approved by the Board of Visitors uh, a few weeks ago. We are completing the so-called website, uh, uh, providing more information about these certificates. You need to wait a week to 10 days until we are finished with the revision of what we have in the, web and the website. So uh, at this moment, I don't suggest you uh, try to find more information about it. Uh, we can provide you in person or via an email, but again, five or 10 days from now, it would be possible. So John is asking, may I ask what the financial requirements of the MS and PhD are? Can I ask you to clarify that question? You can turn your microphone on. Are you asking how much it costs? Oh, okay. So what, what are you asking exactly? Cost difference? Um, you mean per, per credit hour? Um, I believe it's just a few hundred dollars difference between the two. Um, I'd have to look it up. I haven't, I haven't looked at it since they make their judgment about what they're going to charge per credit hour at the institution level. Uh, so that is on our website. If you want to email one of us, we'll email you the uh, correct information. Um, but it's, I, I, I think it's just a few hundred dollars difference between the two. Does that, is that what you mean? Total projected? Um, I, I think so. Yes. Um, I, 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 again, I don't, I hate to commit without looking at the numbers, but yeah, yeah I think it's close to that. Um, why don't I look it up while you're here? While Professor Losser look at it, I hope the information that we provided it was adequate for others who are in attendance. And uh, again, if you have, uh, yes, uh, if you have any questions, don't be hesitant to communicate with us. We can answer them quickly as we can. So um, just just rough, rough estimate. Um, it's between uh, 70 and 72 for tuition only. Um, there's not much in the way of student fees for the Ph.D. program. So uh, the MS, yeah, I think it's about 45 K. So it's about half. And that's because with the Ph.D., there are more credit hours uh, there. There's a large, you know, uh, uh, quite a few more courses that you have to take. And so uh, we have it budgeted out for three years, although it can take a little bit longer. Um, it's between 70 and 72 K. Okay. You're welcome. There was a question. Uh... All right. So I think the question was, has this always been a hybrid program? We have always had a residential program, if that's what you're asking, yeah. um, since its inception. Students have always come to campus uh, for, uh, in the beginning, it was just for a few days, and then it grew into a needs-based uh, change in the curriculum. And they, um, you know, it's really obvious that uh, our graduates needed to have more hands-on training and certification. Um, it's just a better uh, outcome for the students because uh, at first we only took uh, individuals who are working in IVF and then a few years after uh, the program started in 2003, um, around 2004, 2005, 
uh, students or applicants started asking us if they could join us, even if they weren't working in IVF. And so when we started doing that, we realized that we needed to um, alter our curriculum to help those individuals get an experience in working with embryos and working in uh, human gametes uh, in general. And so we had to establish this change um, in order to better support that uh, group of students. And it, it helps us in multiple ways, um, but it has been a hybrid program since the beginning, uh, to answer your question, which means that you do spend some time on campus. Which is one week uh, per um, summer or summer. Summer. It's about a week, um, and I, I just want to talk a little bit about the second year residential program. The students, when they come to campus, they present their thesis and capstone proposals. It's what they've worked on for a semester, and when they get here, they present it to the rest of the student body and the entire uh, faculty usually attends these meetings, and your faculty advisor is there, and so... It's a really positive experience. It's a great way to launch the uh, master's project, which is a requirement that takes you about a year to uh, complete. I hope that makes sense. Oh, you were asking is if this has always been a hybrid program, meaning that has it gone distance because of COVID? And the answer is no. It was always there to support uh, those working in IVF. Um, to support working professionals. And so the majority of the didactic piece was has always been online. Does that make sense, Kavindi? I think she uh, also posted. Yes, it does. She said, yeah. Shadowing. Go ahead, yeah. Leanne. Go ahead, Leanne. Right. Yes. Yeah. Can either of you want to talk about the shadowing requirements? Okay, and uh, you want to uh, pitch in uh, the. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, what, what we really what we really want is for you to see what it's like to be an embryologist. If you do not have experience, and you know, of course, there's two tracks, right? The first track is the group of individuals who are working in IVF. Those individuals, obviously, they know what it's like to be an embryologist. But anybody who's a novice, we really want to support you in the best way that we can and support your decision-making process about joining this program. And so we've always had a shadowing experience since we started taking the novices. We felt it was really important. Um, and so right now, that's very difficult to get a shadowing because um, of COVID. However, we have been successful in getting people into shadow um, even in the last few months. So I'm optimistic you can try. Uh, the requirements is that you need to go for one day and observe what it's like to be an embryologist. I hope that makes sense. You don't have to spend very much time. We just want you to observe and look and see. And we have a lot of friends around the country. Some of them have said yes, that, People can come in on a limited basis, and some practices, really, they won't let you in. But it's worth a shot. If you can't get in, uh, we do have an alternative, but the best thing would be for you to try to visit a clinic. Uh, we can help you. I can certainly help you um, try to get in. We can write a letter um, to the clinic as well. Sometimes that has helped um, explaining why you want to do the shadowing, usually observing things like transfers, uh, retrievals, um, fertility checks, cryopreservation, ICSI, biopsy, just watching what it is that an embryologist does every day, including the paperwork and quality control. Yeah, I want to add that while it's highly desirable, uh, the so-called laboratory profession and highly paid profession, uh, there are limitations and disadvantages that uh, the purpose we want to you be aware of it. One example of it is uh, commitment to work uh, continuously. The, the weekends, sometime early hours of morning, you have to come and check the embryos. Sometimes you have cryopreservation that the patient comes in and you have to do it late in the afternoon. 
uh, weekends, holidays, as I mentioned to you also, these are the limitations of the, of the profession. And hopefully, if any of you go for that uh, one day, uh, so-called shadowing, uh, you will find out uh, more about these uh, limitations. Uh, but again, in the era of COVID, uh, we have established a, a replacement for that shadowing, even though we always say that nothing replaces the direct contact that you have with the embryologist in IVF setting. It does not replace what we have uh, uh, so-called implemented as a replacement for shadowing at the time that you may not be able to arrange it in a town that you are or in a nearby towns. Uh, any Anything, uh, Dr. Yu or Dr. Mayer, you can add to it or you want to add to it? No, I, I think you you hit it right. Uh, before you get into this and spend two years in a master's program or longer in a PhD, if you're not familiar with the uh, work that's done in an andrology or embryology lab, we wanted to make sure you were at least aware of it and you had a chance to talk to people who were working in this area and, and get an idea for, of, you know, sometimes what we think um, a, a, a particular activity is uh, doesn't turn out to be exactly as we envisioned it. And so this is just a, uh, you know, a short spend one day and um, make sure that uh, it's exactly what you think it is. Another thing it does for you is uh, introduces you to, potentially introduces you to a local lab where you, if you're not a uh, practicing embryologist or working in IVF at the time that you apply to the program, if you're accepted, it's a possibility that you could use that um, clinic in the future as a potential internship site, or you may even find out that they um, they need people to work for them, and you might find a job. There was a question, uh, that, uh, Dr. Yu, uh, what was that? Uh, can you pose it to us? It was a chat uh, question that came. Because I understand uh, that you, thank you so much for answering my question. I'm sorry, I'm having a cough. Who is the best person to reach for further questions about the program sure. in the future? Sure. Uh, I have emailed you, all of you. I did it last night, and I hope you uh, have received my email as well. Uh, you can send me an email, and certainly I'm um, able to answer. If I am not, I will forward it to Dr. Uh, you know, Dr. Yu, the mayor, uh, Professor Russell. Uh, they are experienced enough to be able to answer any questions about our programs. Certainly, we encourage all of you uh, to do that. Uh, so don't be hesitant uh, to send us as many emails that you wish uh, to answer your questions, certainly. To okay, thanks, John. John's going to leave. He has to do something okay. else. Um, okay. Yeah, please follow up. Thank you. Yeah. All right. And uh, any other question related to masters before we start with the PhD? And I get to the PhD if it help us. And I was helping you. All right, wonderful. Thank you for doing that. And uh, all right, for those who are uh, here again, still with us. Uh, we are going to discuss the Reproductive Clinical Science PhD program. And we, in that context, we are going to discuss the goals of the program, curriculum, the career potential, and admission requirements. 
So the objectives or the goals of the program to evaluate advances in molecular biology, comparative uh, reproductive anatomy and physiology, and develop developmental biology, as well as laboratory management as they applied to clinical reproductive science. So all of these so-called areas uh, will be so-called considered when you apply for or so-called take a PhD program. And uh, it helps you the direct and manage all or learn to direct and manage all aspects of clinical reproductive science laboratories, such as in vitro fertilization, andrology, endocrinology, and gamete cryobanking. All of these are the components of uh, collectively called art or assisted reproductive techniques that you learn to become master and eventually so-called manage these laboratories. And you also learn uh, to critically evaluate and to interpret the current literature as well as the federal regulations as they apply to the field of human reproduction. Uh, again, you are going to learn to develop and implement laboratory processes and procedures so that you will have best clinical laboratory practices and outcomes and in compliance with all regulations. So that's basically what you learn to do and establish and maintain protocol records and data for practice performance, quality control, continuous quality improvement, uh, as well as laboratory inspections and accreditations by the states and federal regulatory agencies. As you know, the uh, clinical laboratories are all regulated. They have to be accredited by various agencies. And certainly you as a PhD, the so-called uh, uh, major or finishing with the PhD, you will be able to manage all these aspects and design and implement and evaluate laboratory research practices uh, for improvement of projects that you have or clinical projects that uh, your center has. And also you will have certainly a dissertation research projects for your PhD program. And uh, again, there are the staffs that as a PhD, you need to manage them. You have to teach them or provide them with their educational backgrounds, uh, clinical staff, physicians, lab techs, all of these individuals would be under your directions in regard to what is going on in the laboratory that you are in charge of. And you will be a member of interprofessional clinical team to evaluate ethical, legal aspects of assisted reproductive technology, design procedures, certainly is your function, and protocols to address clinical and patient-related concerns, privacy concerns, safety, and legal guidelines. All of these things you will learn uh, to manage and do. Uh, curriculum for uh, so-called PhD program is again similar to master's is a cohort schedule, meaning you take all of your courses together would be two or three classes at a time. You will have a research project that you have to conduct uh, and write a dissertation for that. And you will spend around 20 to 30 hours of work a week. It's a little bit more than masters in regard to the number of hours that you have to spend. In reality, sometimes it may reach as far as high as 40 hours. Uh, again, it's a PhD program, it's uh, highly so-called demanding. So in reality, you are going to have another uh, three-fourths or a full-time job if you have uh, already a, a so-called job that you are involved in. Uh, curriculum, the curriculum for the, for the PhD it has 
some courses that certainly more advanced than the masters is advanced statistics and uh, CSA reproductive techniques journal club that discusses current topics in assisted reproduction. You will have comparative anatomy and physiology of reproduction, very, very useful course, because again, when you want to conduct research, you want to know what uh, the, basically, if you are not dealing with human, what uh, type of animals uh, are matching uh, with really the human uh, so-called part of human reproduction. So you don't want to choose a, 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 an animal for research a project that uh, the results are not comparable to what we have uh, in human so-called or expect in human. Experimental design, you will have courses for that, advanced topics in IVF and certainly Another important course, develop, developmental biology, is that uh, you get involved with as well. You will have, as I mentioned, you will have dissertation research proposal development, and eventually you will do work on your own research, and you will have toxicology and fertility, and again, as uh, with the master's program, Infertility is not limited to female infertility. Always you have also male contributing to infertility. You will have advanced topics in male infertility journal club that discusses the most current issues related to male infertility. You will have uh, uh, clinical laboratory management. Again, as a PhD graduate, you can be PhD, you will be eligible to direct laboratories, of course, with certain exams that you have to pass board exam. Nevertheless, for research purpose, you will be eligible immediately to take uh, so-called uh, uh, stay at the helm uh, in regard to research projects or research uh, facilities that require a PhD graduate uh, for clinical purposes. Again, you have to take uh, an exam. It's called ABB, American Board of Bioanalysis. And uh, I am sure uh, Professor Russell and uh, uh, Dr. Mayer, you uh, elaborate on that one at the end when we go to answer uh, questions that you may have. Again, uh, we'll cover also the, the business of IVF and the rest of the third year and portion of the second year would be uh, so-called, you will be involved with your research projects. So the program delays for a PhD details is that it's designed for adult learners and working professionals who are in the workplace while they are enrolled in this program. So individuals who are already working individuals, uh, often they take this uh, so-called challenge of, uh, uh, of getting a PhD uh, so-called degree as well. Uh, is a uh, one on-campus course uh, during the program that can be arranged uh, in any of the years, as far as I know. And mainly when you come in, you will be assisting the master's students for their so-called uh, uh, residential programs. So basically, uh, you are coming and you are engaged in the teaching uh, for the lower class, so-called. It would be a total uh, 49 credit hours program, and uh, we project that it will be completed in 32 months. However, because of the nature of independent research, uh, it may not necessarily be 21 to 32 months. It may be uh, taking longer for you to finish with everything. Uh, again, uh, mission uh, of our PhD program is to provide excellent graduate education in preparing you 
uh, to direct and manage uh, pre-clinical laboratories that's called the productive clinical laboratories and or conduct independent research. So there are individuals who prefer to go for becoming a director of a clinical laboratory. Uh, they can do that or individuals who want to conduct independent research. Also, they are given opportunity to do that and with the learning uh, that uh, the courses that they take uh, during their two or three year program here with the PhD program. So here admission requirements for the PhD program. You have to have a master's degree in reproductive clinical science or related areas of study. And uh, the related areas is mentioned to the right of the so-called uh, this slide. It could be clinical embryology, biology, molecular biology, developmental biology, reproductive science, or biochemistry. And we accept other uh, master science after we review them to see really if they are so-called compatible with the so-called design of our PhD program and uh, you need to have a GPA of three or better in your master's. And if a um, master of science so-called in related areas that I mentioned to you, you have to have certain prerequisites. And these prerequisites are biochemistry, introductory to biostatistics, molecular cellular biology, and genetics or development or biology. These are prerequisites. We have had cases where individuals did not have these courses and they took it while they were applying for the PhD program or with occasion, at occasions we allow them to take some of the courses of the PhD to see if they are able to handle these rigor of these courses with the backgrounds that we thought they may not have. And some of them have been successful in managing the courses of PhD so that they can, we could so-called justify uh, their acceptance into the program. I'm sure Professor Russell, Mayor, you know, that you can elaborate on this if any question arises when I finish with my presentation. And uh, again, we need all documents of your uh, so-called previous uh, official institutional official documents. Uh, again, uh, 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 requirements, uh, you need to have a background in clinical embryology and neurology for at least three years work in embryology so-called experience uh, that one is one of the requirements so even though if you have not had have if you have had courses uh, again uh, this is one of the requirements that we need you to have because again for your research projects uh, you will have to work in a laboratory that uh, is andrology or embryology, basically embryology laboratory, and you have to have access to the so-called uh, environment uh, or the working conditions that helps you to so-called finish with your research projects. You will have letters of support from employers indicating that they are going to support your research. Uh, remember, for a PhD, you need to have your research project yourself and you have to conduct it where you are working. So if you do not have that capability, again, the program may not be the most suitable program for you. So in doing a research and doing research in a work, the place that you work requires your employee to consent to that. So we have to have that letter of support when you apply for the PhD program. And there would be three letters of recommendation that are 
part uh, compared to two from the master for the masters. And, uh, it should be from individuals who know you academically or professionally, and certainly cannot be from relatives or family members. Uh, you need to write a personal essay. Again, uh, uh, how to complete it would be the online. Uh, we can provide you also with information if you require additional information about the personal essay. You need to take a GRE scores and uh, international students, similar to the masters, they need to have uh, TOEFL for individuals whose native language is English, and uh, contact information for PhD program uh, or for our master's program is a school of health profession. There are numbers here and also so-called uh, admission, HBA admission at EDMS EDU is an email address. Nevertheless, if you have, you have my email, if you have any particular question, a specific question, you can email me, I can forward it to individuals who can answer your question the best. Again, it's a contact information uh, for reproductive clinical science overall uh, for every program that we have. Now, with this, uh, I finish a presentation of our PhD program and we are open to your questions or uh, or any comments that any of our faculty uh, desire to make. Does anybody have any questions about the PhD program? Are any of you interested in learning more about the PhD program? Are you all here because of the masters or did you have an interest in the PhD program? You can just raise your hand, the little hand next to the underneath the video. So, uh, um, Ara, um, <clears throat> is there anything that um, I'm going to promote you to a presenter so you can turn on your microphone. Is there anything in particular that you need more information about? Hi, uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, you sound great. Oh, thank you. Uh, and thank you for such a, an um, an informative uh, session. I am um, working on my master's degree right now, and I'm finishing actually in a few days. Um, but uh, yay! <laughs> I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm really interested in this program. Um, uh, I think the only thing is about the three years of embryology and andrology. Um, if we don't have uh, if we don't have that qualification, but um, I've purposefully, um, uh, what's it called, uh, done uh, or a big part of the research uh, focus on my degree is uh, fetal development and um, and reproductive health. Is is it something that can well, be ruined or? Uh, no, not really. Um, I, I think probably you could benefit from uh, maybe having a conversation um, with with me, actually, um, and it could be we could set up a time to really talk through what your career objectives are and what, you know, what your goals are. Um, the reason we have that three year requirement um, is because we this PhD program was created um, a few years ago, uh, you know, maybe five or six years ago. We started working on it. It took a long time to get it in the hopper. We actually probably worked on it more like 15 years, but that, that's, uh, that's neither here nor there. But, uh, the, the bottom line for this program is that we're here to support people who are already working in IVF and reproductive medicine. And that is because the research component, which is a, which is an enormous part of the pro, uh, program is, uh, you do have to do it where you're working. Now, you know, I think there's a potential for, for waiving that requirement, but it would, would, would require some real in-depth conversations with you. Um, so I would recommend that, um, you know, 
you reach out to us and uh, I, I would personally like to meet with you and talk to you about what your what your career objectives are. Um, yes, yes, oh, that is cool. Can, can are you that? from John, John Hopkins? Are you studying at Johns Hopkins? All right. uh, yes, I am. Um, and my master's degree is in individualized genomics and health. Yeah, very interesting uh, uh, major. And certainly, as uh, Professor Russell mentioned, uh, uh, communicate with us to see if there's anything uh, we can help you. Uh, certainly, seeing what you have taken course-wise, it would be helpful. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, additional uh, so-called contact uh, or help, uh, if we can offer, uh, we are not hesitant of doing that. Dr. May? Yeah, I was just going to add that uh, the PhD program, uh, one of its purposes, it's not its sole purpose, but the vast majority of our students would like to one day become uh, directors of clinical lab uh, reproductive laboratories. And uh, in the U.S., all clinical laboratories um, must, uh, the director of those laboratories must be board certified or an MD. And in order to get the board certification, you need educational background. That we're supplying. But one of the other requirements for board certification is that you have to have so many years of experience. So mm -hmm. uh, the reason we have that in there, one of the reasons, is to make sure you have sufficient of a background or, or uh, work experience to be able to get that board certification once you've graduated. So it, it's, right. it's more complicated than than just our requirements for our course. Right, and, and although not every person who is enrolled in our program, the PhD program, cares about that because they're, they're from a different country where um, sitting for the HCLD is not required to be a lab director, like for example in Canada. Um, they don't really care that much about the exam from the American Board of Bioanalysts. They don't, they're not really that concerned. What they really want is to be an independent researcher. But everything that we do in this program is geared toward you doing that kind of research. But I, you know, it doesn't mean that we would say absolutely no, um, but it would require, you know, kind of a deeper conversation mm -hmm. that we would be willing to have with you. Um, yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to uh, speaking with you. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, yes, one thing, yes, I, one thing I want to add uh, to the four individuals who have stayed with us for the PhD program, even though they may have been interested or they may be interested in a master's program, certainly uh, getting to our master's program opens the door for you to eventually also apply for our PhD program. So if your ultimate goal is to become an independent researcher or a director of a clinical IVF laboratory, uh, certainly the obtaining a master's program uh, as a first step to get to the PhD program is the best. Uh, so those just, who have stayed uh, certainly. A, as a support yeah. to what you just said, we have we have some master's students who have enrolled in our master's program because they want to get into our PhD program. And they know that it's a smooth transition and uh, could sh shave some time off. We've had, um, Several, I mean, many of our master students were our first PhD students. But also right now, we have had a person who has started in the master's program again with the intent to complete her PhD. And she finished her master's degree last spring and started her PhD in our program in the fall, this past fall. And so she's now, um, making that transition uh, just exactly what Dr. Morchetti said, and it's going very, very well for her. So it's mm -hmm. kind of exciting um, to do both things uh, back to back because it's more uh, traditional when you go to get a PhD to complete a certain portion of your PhD 
in some programs, you're automatically awarded a master's degree. And that's sort of our thought process with people who want to do this back to back. It may sound a little crazy right now, but it certainly is something that other people are have done. And there's another student who there's actually two students in um, the class of uh, in the class above her that are are doing the same thing. And then there's a student in the current master's program who who's going to graduate in the spring and would like to get into the Ph.D. program immediately. So must not be that bad if they want more. <laughs> okay. And again, I thank Ami or Amy, I assume, Era or Ara. It's Ami. Bia Ami. Yeah. Okay. And Ara, uh, Bianca, uh, Kapila, and Kavindi. I thank you for the saying uh, uh, for the entire talk. And certainly we are able to help you if you have any additional questions. Uh, you have my email, as I mentioned to you. And certainly if I answer, I am able to answer a question, I do. Otherwise, I forward it to individuals who are able to answer your questions. And so don't be hesitant. Yeah, we're, we're all very friendly people, you can tell. And we want to help, so... If you have even the slightest question, just let us know. Um, Dr. Morchetti, um, do you think that we're done? or? I think uh, unless uh, there are questions, uh, that we are uh, going to uh, Ah, Okay, Bianca, you want me to promote you so that you can turn on your microphone? You should be able to talk now. If you don't, you if you don't have a microphone or it's not working, that you, to, to turn on your microphone, you just have to go below the where the PowerPoint is. Down below where the the PowerPoint is, there's a little image of a microphone. If you left click on it, it should turn on. If you're having trouble with that, you could just text your question. Hello. She oh, she, there she is. There she is. Okay, go ahead. Hi. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to know um, what is the day-to-day -day basic um, workload or course load that we would have to be involved in for the master's program? Okay, mm -hmm. so... Day to day. Very good question. Right yeah, it's very, very good, good question. question. I'll, I will tell you that the way the program works is just what Dr. Morchetti said. <coughs> it's a cohort. Okay, mm -hmm. so you have a group of, of students that join the program at the same time. And you all go through the same courses each semester. So you in, you're all enrolled in the same courses. There's at this time, there's no um, alternative uh, coursework, so it's all strictly cohorted. And so the curriculum that uh, Dr. Morchetti presented is the curriculum that you take semester by semester. And each of those courses are broken down into sections. We call them modules. You might have a course where you have three weeks per module, Mm -hmm. and have an exam, or you may have a course where it's four weeks or, or five weeks, something like that over a 16-week normal semester. Uh, in the summer, you have courses that are typically 10 to 12 weeks long. And okay. so, again, you still have modules, but they may be shorter modules in the summer, or they may be, you know, two large modules of four weeks or t five weeks each. And each week, we try to release the, each module all at once, if we can. Each week, you have a series of lectures that may be voiced over or they may be scripted, which means that the faculty has produced a PowerPoint that has all the information that you need with notes at the bottom in the notes section or a separate document called a notes document. And you have reading assignments. It's just like being in a class, 
but everything is posted in our learning management system called Blackboard, as Dr. Morchetti mentioned. And mm -hmm. so when you go into a classroom, there is a main menu on the left-hand side, and each menu option takes you to a place in the course. And you click on the content area for the course, and it shows you that, you know, the module breakdown. You have a syllabus. You have a schedule that's posted in the course. It shows you the module breakdown and when things will be happening. In many of your courses, you have assignments. You may have a project that you have to do, or you may have a discussion board that you have to contribute to. A discussion board is like a, a really focused blog. So we might post a paper for you to read and then ask you a series of questions. You then have to answer the questions in a primary post, and then you have to talk to each other in this written way, in this blog way, um, by observing your classmates' answers and making comments like, oh, I didn't think about that. You know, that's very fascinating. I was thinking about it this way. And interacting with each other, be substantive in your discussion. And you may have one of those a week, um, either a project where you're actually physically doing something or you're um, doing a discussion board. Uh, we have uh, some case studies that are electronic case studies like simulations. Um, we do, as I said, each week is broken into lecture um, objectives for that week, and that's also very important. So when you get the week material, you know, if you get it all at once, if a, a faculty member opens this uh, three-week or four-week module all at once, you'll read through the objectives, listen to the lecture, take notes. We give you the PowerPoint separately. Um, if it's a scripted uh, PowerPoint, you'll open the notes and read what the faculty would have said if they were voicing it over and look at the slides and try to understand along with the supplemental reading. We do have textbooks in some courses. In some courses, it's all current research articles. Um, and then, you know, these projects are due usually within a week or two. Uh, discussion boards are usually posted on Monday, primary posts due on Saturday, um, and then final posts are due the following Monday. Does that all make sense, uh, Bianca? Yes, yes, that was, that was very helpful. Yeah, I mean, I could show you what this stuff looks like um, by sharing my uh, computer screen. I don't know if we have time to do that today, but um, it's very organized and it has to be because we have a whole group of people who are depending on us to be very organized. Yes, especially because we're, well, most of us are probably working in the field. And that's right. That's right. And just so you know, there are very few times when you're, when you have a live course uh, lecture. Mm -hmm. You know, so, for example, the Journal Club course, which is your second semester, which is in the fall of your first year, that's one of my courses. And you're not required to be there, but if you're um, if you can't come, you watch a recording of the presentation that your uh, classmates give. Mm -hmm. And then there's an assignment that you have to do. If you can come live, you can ask questions and, and participate in the discussion while, you know, after they're done with their presentation. So I don't know if you've ever, have you ever had a journal club course? No. no I haven't. It's really fun. <laughs> you, you read a paper and you break it down and you present it as if it's your own work, basically. Um, mm -hmm. In the master's program, we have groups of two or three students that present together. So it's more of a group project. It makes it a little less daunting. Mm -hmm. And then as you move through the program, you'll have more of these kinds of projects that maybe aren't necessarily live. They may be recorded presentations where you actually get to do this on your own a little bit more with the help and guidance of your faculty, whoever the faculty is in your course that requires that. But it, it's very, very, it's an excellent way to learn about the current literature, how to be critical about research. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. And, and classmates really get into it and they, you know, ask a lot of questions of this big discussion. And it's just it's wonderful. It's my favorite way to teach and learn. Yeah, certainly. Uh, the, while you are presenting, uh, the aim also is that not only you learn what others have done uh, in their uh, studies that they have published, 
also you will learn how to criticize it. And uh, Professor Russell mentioned that uh, because again, a joint conversation with the others as well as the faculty teaches you how to critically uh, evaluate published studies. Not every published study is perfect in every way possible. So you will learn Pardon how to, any. Exactly. <laughs> and you learn how to criticize it and say, okay, it should have been done this way rather than the way they did it. That's a part of the learning process and making you uh, so called ready for uh, possible uh, research. Uh, or the whole and, reason exactly. you have this course right. is and, to prepare you to do your master's project. Yeah. That is correct. I mean, it's yeah. to teach you how to critically evaluate uh, the literature. We even give you a guideline about how to critically evaluate research uh, articles, yeah. just as an interjection there. Yeah. And since our program has been distant program from the inception, uh, we are uh, very much equipped uh, with the delivery of information to you. It's not just we started, like, uh, uh, for example, some schools that they had in-person instructions and they had to change it and there are some deficiencies. Uh, we have uh, been uh, so-called doing it for years. And also, as you mentioned, uh, 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 is uh, good for individuals who are working during the day. So the uh, so-called reading, teaching, uh, so I'm not teaching, learning, it can be uh, arranged at the evening time. It can be done on weekends. So you can take your exams, for example, on weekends. Uh, we give you two or three days time period so that you take your exam, for example, so, or review uh, the lectures. Uh, so all of these things can be done off hours. Uh, even though additional time beside your regular working hours, nevertheless, it makes it a little bit easier for you. It's not uh, during the day that you have to be uh, at classes. Uh, it can be off hours, as I mentioned. Right. And so um, all of those journal club presentations are at night. Um, yeah. And the, the the guideline is that you have to be you have to present to your faculty, um, and if the other class members can come. I will tell you that this year was a banner year for attendance. Almost every student came to every journal club, which was remarkable and very gratifying. It's it's more fun if you have more people there. So, All right. I see Devin Hodge uh, join us a little bit late, and uh, I am not familiar with that name, and if you want to... Uh, Professor Russell, elevate him to the, to make his microphone uh, available to see the, if he can tell us anything. We can help him uh, before we start with the presentation. I am sorry oh. for joining late, um, but uh, I, I've joined in on a couple of other little presentations that you guys have done since I am very interested in the EVMS program. I think it's it's a, a wonderful program. Um, I'm working in the field as an embryologist, and that's kind of why I'm late today. So many procedures this morning, uh, but I definitely yeah. wanted to drop in and see who is here. And uh, I did want to verify that the session was being recorded just so I can access it, um, you know, a little bit later when I have some more time. Yes, certainly the recorded and we can uh, communicate with you and provide you with the link uh, so that you can listen to it. And, and uh, we have, I assume, since you have registered, we have your uh, email address. We can send you uh, information and also provide you with our email address so that you can communicate with us directly. Um, that would so, be great. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Where do you work, Devin? Uh, which uh, laboratory? Where? I um, I'm working at CCRM in Northern Virginia okay. right now. Okay. Oh. Okay. So we're neighbors. Not, not, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Not far from us. Yes. So I we, thought we we know um uh your uh, uh lab director Jason Swain pretty pretty well. He's um he's a well known um, guy. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. we, we've actually, he's come here, um, and, um, several, several of his, uh, employees have been through our program, so. How long? I mean, we re- we, yeah, how long you're guy. working there in Northern Virginia branch? Not, not very long. Um, I actually moved from California, um, where I started my career a couple of years ago, I moved out here, mm-hmm. uh, and I've been here for a couple of months now. Okay, good. Okay. Good move. The Northern Virginia CCRM opened uh, within the last couple of years. Isn't that true? Yes, that's correct. It's a beautiful yeah. lab. It's a wonderful lab. Yeah. 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 yeah it's a very successful uh, uh, so-called program, CCRM. And, uh, hopefully, your site is as successful as they have been. Uh, uh, with the centers back into the in the west west of the country, so uh, I'd say so. Yeah, Dr. Moshadi, I think before we end the session, we should encourage everyone to uh, participate the survey. If yes, you you remember. Yeah, I mentioned uh, to all of you at the beginning. Uh, please, uh, when you receive the email, to participate in a survey. Uh, again, participate and express anything that you saw the the important or you want to be included in the uh, so-called uh, next presentations uh, we'll be happy to read your uh, the, uh, input so-called when we receive them back uh, after you you know register and so-called uh, participate in the survey anything else uh, dr you anything no I think nope. We just Dr. Mayor, to, uh, Professor uh, Russell. Thank everyone no. to be with yeah, us. Thank you. Um, thank I think you I have nothing for me. Question. Oh sure, okay. go ahead, Ami. Um, okay, hello again. Um, so earlier in the presentation for the uh, uh, master's program, um, it was mentioned um, about internships at labs that you have affiliations with. Um, so how does that work, I guess, like applying for an internship or like do we kind of just individually reach out to labs to answer There's, that? That is such I'm, an excellent question. I'm, uh, I'm sorry interrupting you. There is a possibility we may be disconnected at 11.45. If we are, uh, we are going to answer you with the email. So okay. while Professor Russell continuing, if it's a possibility we may be caught. So remember that. Uh, if we are not finished with answering your question, we communicate with you via email. Okay, go ahead. So, then. Ami, there's a, this is sort of, um, in, internships are uh, usually, uh, especially because we are a distance program for the most part, we're hybrid, but we're mostly distance. Um, usually, we don't want to disrupt you if we can help it. And so we recommend that you try to establish an internship where you live or close by, and we can help you with that. Um, we've helped quite a few students uh, with that. Um, if that is not possible, we have alternatives where we could place you in various places around the country, but that would mean that you would have to relocate at least for a short period of time. Another method is through something called an internship course, which we have ha- used in the past. That's more intensive training where you get a lot more focused one-on-one training. Um, we have a, uh, quite a few affiliated labs around the country in on the West Coast, on the East Coast, and in the middle of the country. And so because we have them in various places, um, it's sometimes that is an option that students have used. Uh, another thing that you may find is that during the time that you're in the program, once you start the program, you may be fortunate enough to find a position in IVF. Um, that's another thing that has happened. The majority of our novices for the past two years have either been able to establish their own internships where they live, or they've gotten jobs, or once they got their internship, they then got a job where they were doing their internship, and they haven't really needed the external um, training course um, that we also have as an um, alternative or option. Does that make sense, Ami? Yeah, that does. Thank you. 
Yeah, and we work with you and work with other faculty. We have faculty who come in for the residential program from all over the country, and some of those individuals can also help uh, you uh, where, sometimes where you live or uh, elsewhere to try and find a, a good internship. Um, and so, and also to establish the relationship with the place that you're doing the internship, we have to be involved in that. Okay, sounds good. I hope good. that makes sense. Okay. We did not get cut off. Oh, yeah, surprise. <laughs> 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 All right, maybe well, very forgot, good. Maybe they forgot about us and they left us alone. <laughs> well, we are in our own meeting room, so I don't think that's, Okay. I, I don't think they need the space. <laughs> All right. Well, very good. All right. So All should right. I stop the recording then? Dr. Morshetti, yes. are you good? Yeah. Okay.